Um, you write a wonky financial book like I did, and people don't usually ask you to come give readings. <laughs> they ask you to come give um, PowerPoint presentations. And I'll be giving one of those for the um, Louisville Society of Certified Financial Analysts on Wednesday. If anybody wants to come, I can get you the details. Um, and, and actually, I've always been sort of jealous. It's like, well, so easy. You just read, and I have to make up a speech. And then I started looking through my book for seconds to read, and it was hard. Because <laughs> I tried really hard, and I have minor literary pretensions, and I really wanted to make this book I've written a story with characters and, and a beginning and an end and drama. But it's really wonky. Um, so I, I picked a section here. Basically, I, I decided I picked one person who you may recognize from TV, and, and another guy in this section is a local boy. So I figured that would appeal to everyone, maybe a little bit. Um, and then, but let me give, my book is basically the story of the rise and partial fall of this academic ideal and idea of how financial markets work. And it, it came in several different guises under different names. There's the efficient market hypothesis, the rational expectations hypothesis out of economics, and then some corollary theories like Black-Scholes option pricing theory, the capital asset pricing model. And what they all sort of rely on to, to greater or lesser extent is that, first of all, financial markets can see through everything, that they're these amazing, processors of information that can't be fooled, and therefore come up with prices that are at some level mostly right, or at least fluctuate around the correct values. And then the other part of it that sort of got attached to it, it doesn't have to, is this idea that whatever markets do will be within sort of statistically manageable bounds, that you can put together formulas to calculate the risk of financial markets. And I gotta say, I started writing this book in 2003, um, and so I didn't know we were going to have this financial crisis to stimulate sales of my book. Um, and, and I was actually supposed to be done in May 2005, um, but I wasn't. So on to my passage. So I, I described the, these ideas. We come in here in the 1970s when they were really at their peak, but the first dissidents were starting to make their voices heard. And the first of all is Robert Schiller, who's a Yale economist who you see on, if you ever watch CNBC, you see him on there with his floppy hair saying vague but very interesting things about how weird financial markets are. Robert Schiller, who got his doctorate from MIT in 1972, was a sophisticated statistician and a crack computer programmer. He combined those skills with a seemingly naive eagerness to apply them to questions so simple that they could seem childlike brazen, or even downright lunk-headed. In his dissertation and his early work as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Schiller focused on whether real-world interest rates behaved in accordance with the theory of rational expectations. His answer to that question was mostly, although certainly not entirely, affirmative. He then moved on to the stock market. Irving Fisher and John Byrd Williams were a couple characters you can read pages and pages about in the early part of my book, but I'm just not going to explain who they are right now. If you want to ask me about them later, go for it. Irving Fisher and John Burr Williams had taught that stock prices represented the discounted value of future dividends. Schiller set out to test this assertion in the most straightforward possible way. He compared the movements of the S&P 500 index to subsequent changes in the dividends paid by S&P 500 companies. The stock prices turned out to be vastly more volatile than the dividends. Schiller's graduate school classmate, Robert Merton, and here I gotta pause for a second, that's our local boy. He grew up in Hastings. His dad was a um, very famous sociologist at Columbia. And he's sort of better known because he won the Nobel in economics in 97, and then a year later, the hedge fund in which he was a partner, long-term capital management, almost brought the global financial system down with it. Um, so that's Robert Merton. Schiller's graduate school classmate, Robert Merton, had a ready retort. Of course stock prices were more volatile than dividends because corporate managers went out of their way to keep dividend payments steady. Why they did that was a question for which finance professors had no good answer. But Merton was right that there was another way to look at the discrepancy. Financial market prices are just about the cleanest, hardest to manipulate data in all of economics. If they were more volatile, 
that fundamentals like dividends, earnings, revenue, or book value, Merton argued, maybe the problem was with the fundamentals. And this is a quote from Merton. If the rationality hypothesis is sustained, then instead of asking the question, why are stock prices so much more volatile than measured consumption, dividend, and replacement costs, perhaps general economists will begin to ask questions like, why do measured consumption, dividends, and replacement costs exhibit so little volatility when compared with rational stock prices? Now, I, I sort of I go on from this here, but I, I realized as I was rereading it that I, I need to emphasize basically what he's saying. And I, I remember this quote as being from Tom Waits that I was looking up on the internet and it comes from several different people, but reality is for people who can't face drugs. And what Nick Merton's basically saying is, Reality is for people who can't face you know, the truth being delivered by financial markets. So it is a pretty breathtaking assertion, or funny assertion, whatever you think about it. So back to what I actually wrote. It was a clever bit of argumentation, and one that should elicit at least some sympathy from anyone familiar with the sausage making involved in producing economic data or corporate earnings reports. It couldn't disguise that Merton and his colleagues in finance had no new evidence with which to sustain their rationality hypothesis. Merton trotted out the usual litany of event studies and 1960s random walk work. Yet they weren't enough to establish that stock prices were rational. Schiller's evidence wasn't enough to establish that they were irrational either, but it was enough to throw the whole matter in doubt. His brazen, childlike, even one-headed <clears throat> question had hit its mark, and he knew it. The leap from observing that it is hard to predict stock price movements to concluding that those prices must therefore be right was, he declared at a conference in 1984, quote, one of the most remarkable errors in the history of economic thought. It is remarkable in the immediacy of its logical error and the sweep and implications of its conclusion, end quote. One professor in the audience came up afterward and worriedly advised Schiller to remove these incendiary words from the published version of his paper. Another, with a better sense of how to make one's mark in the world, said, no, no, don't take it out. Or she'll have left them in. And that's the end of my reading. Do we go to Q&A right now? <laughs> so I'd be happy to take questions about this, about the book, about anything else, about Time Magazine, about the train right up here. <laughs> It actually, some of the, it, this was really, it was in the late 70s, it started a little bit, really took off in the 1980s, this whole leverage buyout, hostile takeover movement. And for most of the finance professors who believed in this rational market hypothesis, to them it was, I mean, it was evidence that clearly prices could get out of whack for a little while, but they all just hailed these corporate raiders as the mechanism to return stock prices to their correct values. So, uh, and, and, and also to force corporate executives to pay more attention to their stock price. So in general, and, and it was evidence that clearly these people couldn't make money if stocks were always perfectly priced, but it generally sort of fit in with the worldview of here are markets out finding, you know, finding ways to see through the naughty things that corporate CEOs are doing and, and come up eventually through different mechanisms, in this case, borrowing lots of money from Michael Milken and then buying the company to, to get prices where they need it to be. Now, there's one way back there, and then I'll come up to uh, in, the, you know, in the context of the financial data for the last month, do you have an opinion about the, the plan to regulate financial markets more severely and uh, say the too, too big to fail and legislation? Is that something you're talking about? Um, sure, and I, I don't know what the right recipe is, and, and clearly what's happened, and also I, I think the sort of fall of some of these kind of perfectionist ideas of how markets work sort of leave room for, oh yeah, I guess there might, it might be helpful to regulate. Um, the question is, obviously, if, if markets have this tendency to overshoot and get overly optimistic and overly pessimistic, if you're leaving it purely in the discretion of the Federal Reserve to decide when to do something, they're very often going to get caught up in the same optimism. 
especially. And the pessimism right now, what we've seen over the past couple years, the market's turning incredibly pessimistic and the Fed still being willing to throw money at them. So in that sense, they sort of get the idea that markets need correcting. But nobody's been willing to do that correcting on the upside because I think there's a lot of political risk to it and, and other things. So I, I think what that leads to is this idea that maybe what we need are some just simple, dumb financial regulations that maybe aren't exactly optimal, but keep the craziest things from happening. And I mean, the classic one, which I mean, I and I still think the, the specific separation of glass steagall separating banks from from firms that underwrite stock was a little weird, but it clearly once that was gone, it led to this whole new level of people who were in institutions that were eventually backed up by taxpayers taking really big risks. So some level of <laughs> chopping up institutions, of having really strict leverage requirements on the, the biggest of them all. That seems to make a certain amount of sense. I don't know how exactly to do it, but yeah, I, I think that fits with what's, both what's happened and where the theories have gone. Right here? So from what you were just reading, it sounds as if the financial analysts are saying that they really don't see the picture of the global economy, they, they're trying to figure out a certain pieces and then figuring out rather than taking well, a, a lot of a lot of this this whole a lot of these theories, especially in finance, in the '60s, basically came from a bunch of academics trying to prove that the go-go, highly paid mutual fund managers of the day were mostly frauds. And they were actually right about that. They were mostly frauds, and they were outperforming the market by crazy amounts in the mid '60s, basically by taking huge risks that ended up wiping out their shareholders in the late '60s. And it was sort of, so it, it's totally valid. And, and so the whole theory was, it's harder to beat the market than that. It's harder to outsmart the market than that. If your mutual fund is beating the S&P by 30% every year, it's probably because you're taking crazy risks, not because you're a genius. Um, and that part of the theory is totally valid, valid, but yeah, it sort of got, so that, that sort of narrow emphasis, okay, we proved this. We proved that these mutual fund managers aren't all geniuses who can outsmart the market. But then there was sort of this leap from that to, therefore, the market is always right. And it's just two different things. It's one thing to say it's hard to outsmart the market. It's another thing to say the market is, in some fundamental sense, always this benign, and I'm talking specifically about financial markets, always this benign thing. So yeah, I think it's, it's less financial analysts. I mean, all of us have our blinders. But I think in academic finance, there was just they came up with this new way to see the world. And which was totally valid for the initial area they were attacking, and then they imposed it on everything else, and it got a lot less valid as it went along. <coughs> there were other people. Yeah. That was wondering. I mean, this is connected to what you were just saying. In terms of your discussion with like academic economists, so having really been sort of tied to rational choice theory and like that, if, if you see that one way, and and what is the offering of it as sort of these grand theories of how markets work. If in some way the last few years have, have proved the extent of these rational choice theories. So. I mean, I think they have, although one of the interesting things is when I first started working on the book, I thought very much it would be the story of the fall of this totally rational view of markets and the rise of something based more on psycho psychology and behavioral economics. And that hasn't really happened because behavioral economics has all sorts of great lessons about how individuals behave and how you want to design a 401k so people are less stupid with their money. It hasn't been that helpful in figuring out, predicting what the market's going to do or explaining what the market does. And as far as I, I think a lot of the most convincing explanations of what happened over the past five or six years was people behaving in this, at least for themselves, in a somewhat you know short to medium term sense, totally rationally. You know, mortgage brokers, somebody cobbling together all these mortgages into securities and selling them, they were behaving like people trying to maximize their well being. And and so it wasn't that they were crazy, it's that somehow it didn't you put it all together and you can have a lot of rational people and they still form herds and do things that on a macro level are totally crazy. 
And that part, I think, is something that far more economists are coming around to now than have before. There's still, you know, at the University of Chicago and other places, there's this hardcore who resists even that. But my sense is there's a conversation there that definitely wasn't there 20, 30 years ago. How do you explain China? <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, I mean, obviously, China is a nice example for a, of a country that has chosen not to participate fully in global financial markets. It's tried to participate pretty fully in the global economy, but has kept itself to a certain extent walled off from from financial markets, and it's worked for it really well so far. I think. At some point, you can't get away with that forever because financial markets make mistakes, but I'm sure a bunch of bureaucrats in Beijing are going to make really big mistakes at some point, too. But clearly, when you're following sort of a catch-up path, trying to figure out how to catch up with the world's wealthy countries, there's a lot to be said for not listening to financial markets and not giving them too much, at least global ones, investors from around the world, too much sway in, in figuring out how you're going to run your own economy. I don't think that explains China, but from the context of the book, that thing is something I can say. Back there? Just a comment about rationality. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, for example, I want to maximize my profits for the quarter. I may not be here in two years, so I don't really give a damn. So in a sense, Wall Street is a lot of very smart, very rational people looking after their own self-interest short term, because they can control the long term, but they can certainly control the short term. Right. That's one comment. Secondly, a lawyer from the SEC said, again, it's rational, very rational, but it's mostly driven by insider information on any individual company. He said only one in every 10,000 insider trading cases, like the recent ones, actually get prosecuted. But we see it all the time in our models. And they're the people making the most of the money, not the guy on the sideline who thinks he can outguess what the insiders are doing. Um, I mean, it's funny, I, I gave a talk at Columbia Business School a couple weeks ago, and I was talking about all these theories and yada yada, and afterward this guy comes up to me and you know, he says, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I also worked as an investment banker for a couple decades, and the thing you totally miss in this whole thing is how many sociopaths there are working on Wall Street. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know, because clearly the, the whole insider trading question, that there's some, and, and actually a lot of these sort of diehard Chicago rational market people say, well, more power to them, because these insiders know more, and therefore the more they trade, the quicker that will be embedded in prices, and therefore the more rational prices will be. I mean, it ends up, I guess there's a certain logic to that, but it also it ends up being this fixed game that outsiders don't want to play in. So, I, and, and your first point is basically what I was saying before, that it, 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 it's not necessarily individuals being irrational to deliver these results that don't seem optimal on a society-wide basis. You want me to round it up? Yeah. Okay. Any more? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much.